panelists, uh, with an amazing group of panelists. Um, the topic of this webinar is the challenges and opportunities for supporting early childhood development in context of crisis. We're delighted to have Their World, Moving Minds Alliance, and the UVA Humanitarian Collaborative, as well as Yale University um, represented in this panel. Um, I will quickly hand it over to our, um, to our moderator, but I wanted to go through some housekeeping um, before we get started, if you could please go to the next slide. So the audio, the audio for participants um, and the video is currently disabled. Uh, we will be holding this uh, webinar in English. So apologies to those who do not use English as their first language, but we will have closed captioning available. The session will be recorded. Um, and we will be posting this on the INEE, INEE website. Um, and just a quick word about the INEE ECD task team, which Netta Elatar and myself are currently the co-leads of. Um, we have come together over the past uh, several years to really bring together a diverse group of practitioners, academics, uh, donors and all of the champions for early childhood development in crisis context to really focus on what are the key issues and how we can support practitioners in the field and improve, quali uh, improve, improve the quality of programming um, in the places where uh, it is needed the most. Um, and so we welcome you to uh, this event and are looking forward to the discussion. Um, we, I will hand it over to our amazing facilitator, Bonita Burungi. Uh, she has a perfect background to be an early childhood development champion with two uh, master's degrees in early childhood education and one in master's in public health. Um, she has uh, a bachelor's in social science. She's currently the director of programs for Elna Philanthropies in East Africa, and she leads the development management of investments, partnerships, um, and is focused on improving the lives of children in East Africa. She comes with over 15 years experience working in the field of early childhood development, health and education. Um, and prior to Elma, she was working with Save the Children. So I will now hand it over to Bonita who will provide, go um, through the agenda quickly and introduce our first panelist. Thank you. Great, thank you, Katie. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I would like to welcome you again to this webinar. We're very excited to have you. We have a great team that will be leading us through several conversations. And as we all know in this field that millions of children are born in crisis and they grow up and spend many of their early years in crisis. And that poses lots of challenges as well as opportunities. And as this webinar, clearly states and our theme today is really those challenges, exploring together those challenges and opportunities and finding ways of supporting these children living in these particular contexts. Um, today we will be focusing on, we'll, we'll have a, a group of panelists that will be leading us through three key conversations, really starting off, you know, exploring and learning, you know, the ECD guidance and, and ECD standards that are out there, and what is available globally that can help us improve the work that we do. We'll be learning very specifically about some specific countries and what they are doing, and Colombia will be one of those countries where we'll borrow some lessons, and we will take time to explore ways of how we can continue to support um, ECD workforce, especially in humanitarian crisis and contexts. So to start us off um, having this conversation, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy Bassett. Lucy is a professor of practice at, at the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. Lucy is an expert, She's, she brings 15 years of experience in humanitarian and development programming, especially connected to the needs of children and caregivers. In addition to teaching, Lucy is co-director of the Humanitarian Collaborative. This is an initiative that generates applied research um, to promote more effective humanitarian action. And this research is really focused on early childhood development and education. Lucy has worked at multiple organizations that are child focused and you know, are leaders in the world, um, including the World Bank. She has worked at UNICEF, the World Food Program, Save the Children, and the International Food Policy Research Institute. 
And over the multiple years in her career, she's really worked very closely with governments in low and middle income countries, both in humanitarian and development contexts. And most of her work has been dedicated to expanding access to quality education, to nutrition and social protection services. And in all the work that she's been, she's been doing, you know, children living in poverty in marginalized uh, settings and their families have been a focus. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy. Over to you, Dr. Bonita, thank you so much for the warm introduction and welcome everyone. I'm glad that you're joining us today. Um, so I will be giving you a quick overview of a review of humanitarian standards and guidance documents. Um, next. So as Bonita mentioned, um, and I'm sure most of you know if you're already on this webinar and interested in the topic that children are dramatically affected by conflict and crisis. And we know the numbers are high. One in four children around the world lives in a conflict or disaster zone. More than 30 million children have been displaced by conflict um, and they're overrepresented in these contexts um, compared to their percentage of the population. And also as Bonita mentioned, um, they are in these situations for a long time. Many crises are lasting for decades now. And so this is really putting children at risk for the entirety of their childhoods and into their early adulthood. Um, and some particular risks for kids in conflict and crisis contexts are one, that their caregivers who we know are critical in supporting young children's development often have fewer resources and less time um, to provide children with attention and, and necessary socio-emotional and cognitive stimulation. Of course, this varies by context, but there's extra pressure on the caregiver. Uh, it could affect the caregiver's mental health and just ability to support children, um, or this could translate into neglect. Um, and then also there's often less access to um, various ECD services that can support both kids and caregivers. Um, and we know that these things can have lasting consequences for kids' development um, and into future generations. Next. Um, we also know that response is insufficient. Um, there was a review of humanitarian response plans that showed that they don't sufficiently cover young children's needs. Um, and a review that Moving Minds Alliance did recently on humanitarian aid um, found that there's just a tiny fraction of this money, 2%, that explicitly targets early childhood development. Next. Um, there are standard resources that are available um, so in humanitarian response, practitioners often use humanitarian standards and guidelines to, to standardize planning, implementation, and evaluation of programming. Um, and these can be really valuable tools um, to support practitioners who may need additional information or just to ensure the quality of the response. Um, and so, I wanna make a distinction and I know there are different definitions, but these are the ones that we used in this review of standards being um, describing the broad principles and essential elements for high quality response and reflecting best practice at a global level. So that's kind of the, the broadest area. And then guidance documents we think of as covering specific points of good practice to consider when applying the minimum standards and adapting key actions in different situations. So below um, on this slide, you'll see some of the most common um, humanitarian standards and just recognize that some of them have a mix of what I've defined as standards and guidance and others are more distinct. Um, next. So um, there's been some consideration of um, how humanitarian standards and guidance uh, address the needs of young children. Their world um, looked at the INEE minimum standards in its safe spaces report. UNESCO looked at um, principles and standards governing 
um, humanitarian crisis and refugee response, but we haven't seen a kind of thorough review of standards and guidance, specifically looking at how well they address the needs of young children and caregivers. So um, next, please. So we undertook a review um, that asked three questions. Um, to what degree do existing standards and guidance explicitly recognize or acknowledge young children and their caregivers as important groups to target in humanitarian response? So first and foremost, are they even prioritized? Um, what are the main gaps in terms of alignment um, with the nurturing care framework, which is over here on the right, these five domains of holistic child development? And then what are some recommended next steps to, um, to strengthen uh, these resources? Next. So we reviewed a total of five standards and 10 guidance documents, next, um, that were the most relevant to ECD and looked at alignment with the nurturing care framework domains, next. And here's an example of what that looked like. So um, we have the different domains across the bottom and the darker colored boxes are standards that, or guidance in other cases that um, had higher degree of alignment and the lighter meant less. And um, the way that we determined this was doing a desk review and, and really doing a coding mention of each of these elements. Um, that was really thorough, and then um, comparing them um, in terms of alignment. Next. Um, we, after doing that review, um, the, the in-depth desk review and analysis, we shared with um, standards holders and conducted seven interviews covering six standards. And we also got feedback from a total of nine standards and guidance documents here. So this was meant as a kind of triangulation um, to make sure that the findings, um, you know, that the review was accurate and um, also to get uh, additional feedback. Next. So I'll just go over quickly some of the main findings. Um, so we found that overall detailed guidance on supporting the youngest children is lacking. So um, while all of the standards um, address children in some way, less than half specifically defined young children, um, and two thirds mentioned caregiver, but only one explicitly defined that. Next. Um, while taken all together, the standards and guidance did cover the elements of nurturing care, but no single set um, had high alignment. Um, and so the areas that were the strongest were um, safety and security and good health. Um, and the INEE minimum standards, not surprisingly, had excellent alignment with opportunities for learning, um, but no document had high alignment with responsive caregiving. Next. Um, and even where the, the overall domain was covered, there were still gaps. So within each domain, we looked at sub domains or sub areas and, and tried to identify. So even if you did, even if one standard did a great job of alignment with opportunities for learning, maybe there were particular elements of that um, that could still be strengthened. And so some of these, um, included care for children with developmental difficulties, nutrition for ill children, um, using local language and involving fathers and extended family. Next. Um, so recommendations included the following, next. Um, so overall, uh, there, was, there was a debate of, about kind of at the beginning of this work, do we need to create something entirely new or can we build on what exists? And over the course of the review and the conversations, the interviews seemed like the consensus was strengthen what exists, don't start from scratch. And that involves um, four things. One is defining young children and caregivers and making sure that those definitions and specifications are included in the documents because what we specify and define um, 
helps us to focus on that. So if it's if it's written in there, it's more likely that people will pay attention and and um, act on it and measure it. Um, develop more practical guidance. So um, there was kind of a call for more specific guidance on key actions and requirements for implementation for each of the um, nurturing care domains and subcategories, including indicators for monitoring and evaluation um, and using accessible language for non-experts. So these documents are really used by um, people who are not experts, I mean, some are experts in ECD, but many are just um, working through other sectors. And so having the language be accessible and um, welcoming to non-experts would be important. And um, luckily the INEE ECD task team is already has a subgroup, a working group um, starting to look into what this guidance could, could look like. So this action is already underway. Another recommendation was to design complementary products. So um, some standards holders told us this and, and other practitioners who we consulted with um, noted that they, um, they don't just access standards and guidance documents as a, you know, like a hard copy uh, document unto itself, but are also interested in, in some other accompanying products. So this could be case studies, a video series, podcasts, um, infographics, uh, and we have some really concrete recommendations for what that could look like, a thematic sheet um, for sphere, a pocket guide, um, et cetera. And then finally, just kind of broader collaboration um, to build ECD content into training about standards and guidance, um, so that it doesn't have to be in the products themselves, but in also the um, conversations with, with partners um, and practitioners. Next. And there was another recommendation to think creatively about format. So as I said, people aren't just bringing out the, their printed copy of something, um, but they're accessing these resources on their phones um, and really open to getting information through video and audio, um, supplementary materials, short online training modules. So it doesn't have to be um, a huge thing, but just adding pieces here and there um, and case studies to show things um, really in embedded in context and, and giving concrete examples. Next. Uh, and then finally, you know, we recognize there are limitations here. This was um, this was a desk review. We talked to a number of standards holders, but there are others that we didn't, and we also didn't reach um, practitioners and communities. So there's an opportunity to learn from other relevant stakeholders whose perspectives could be really important in making any kinds of improvements, whether it's um, the humanitarian standards partnership that brings together a lot of um, standards, um, nurturing care, working groups, humanitarian actors, and, and children and caregivers um, who are basically the ones on behalf of whom these exist. Um, we didn't look at national and organization specific guidance, which we know um, there's quite a bit of, and so there might be some really good lessons learned there. Um, and it would be interesting to look at community engagement um, in these processes. Um, next. Oh, okay, that was the end. So I guess I just wanted to finish you can go, um, by saying that I mentioned that already the INEE ECD task team is working on developing practical guidance tool. Um, and then the INEE minimum standards um, revision process is underway. And many of you have may have received emails about that, but that is an ongoing process to which we will be contributing. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer questions later on in the program. Thank you so much, Lucy, um, for sharing what is out there, what is missing, what opportunities exist to collaborate and strengthen some of this work. And we look forward to the question and answer session at the end. And just to remind everyone that please feel free to, to type your questions in the, in the chat. We'll have, we have time scheduled at the end for everyone to, you know, to ask their questions, have the panelists answer those. 
So please keep them coming. But in the meantime, um, I would like to go forward and um, knowing what we know now, based on what Lucy has presented, there's a lot of gaps. There are lots of opportunities as well. There are lots of uh, resources out there. There are some that really need to be worked on. And I would like to, you know, for our next session, for our next session, invite uh, two panelists that will be leading us. And I would like to introduce first uh, Dr. Angelica Ponguta. Uh, Dr. Is, um, Angelica is a, is a researcher and a faculty member at the Yale Child Study Center. She spent many years um, really working on advancement of, the early, of early childhood development um, in the low and middle income countries with a, a focus on policy research program evaluation and advocacy. Dr. Ponguta had, has led and participated in multiple ECD policy making and policy analysis projects in multiple countries in Africa, in Europe and Central Asia, as well as the Middle East. And she brings a wealth of research expertise that she'll be sharing with us today. She's also leading the adaptation of the youth-led ECD program from Pakistan to the Colombia context. And we'll be learning quite a lot today about Colombia and the work that is being done there. She serves as a principal investigator for the multiple projects, including a sector-wide analysis for early childhood development and education in emergencies in partnership with Dubai Cares. So Dr. Ponguta will be leading us in this session, as well as, um, Lotero Ramirez, uh, who is the other panelist that will be presenting along with, with uh, Dr. Ponguta. And there will be a video that will be shown. Uh, just to quickly introduce Lutero, um, has worked at the Ministry of Education in Colombia, where she supported the implementation of first the, national, the first national study on quality measurement of early childhood services. She has also worked as a project manager in the Evaluation Center for Education. Uh, at the, uh, the Lao Andres University. Pardon me if I pronounce it, you know, not correctly. Lutero is a researcher and continues to be a researcher. The ecological, was a researcher at the ecological approaches to social emotional learning um, and at the settings for early education and development, which is also referred to as the seed hub at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She's currently a consultant at NYU and Global Ties for Children. So please join me in welcoming both Dr. Angelica Ponguta and Lutero Ramirez. Please welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Bonita, for that wonderful introduction. Can you hear me okay? And can you see the slides in presenter mode? Wonderful. Um, so thanks again. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here today and I'm really delighted to share uh, the stage, the virtual stage, I should say, with my colleague Lucero, who joins us from Bogota, Colombia herself. So we will be discussing some of the findings from our sector-wide analysis of early childhood development and education in emergencies, or ECD, EIE, as we will be referring to it um, onwards. Uh, but importantly, I think part of our objective today is also share with you um, some of the reflections on how research like this can actually lead to action. Um, and we're gonna do that through an illustrative example from the field, of course, it's being Colombia. So, um, so in order to facilitate our analysis, of course, we're talking about highly complex systems. Um, we have applied what we're calling, uh, or what is known in the primarily uh, health policy literature as strategic problem solving. So this is a paradigm that offers a framework, I would say, to do two main things. So one, it allows us to define a problem, or in other, way, in other words, a current state, uh, and a desired state or a broader goal, right? Or in other words, a solution to that particular problem. Um, secondly, this paradigm, what it allows us to do is to identify systematically what the root causes of that prob problem might be, and it kind of forces us right, to identify strategic initiatives, but that are grounded in evidence that then we get to systematically implement, evaluate in order to assess if we truly are reaching or not a particular goal. Right? So this is really the conceptual framework that we're gonna use uh, through our conversation today. Um, this process of course is iterative over time, of course, the image that you see in front of you seems to be linear, but of course this process is a continuous iteration as we will mention 
uh, towards the end of our discussion. So our research focuses, and Lucy has done a really nice job in setting up our presentation really, and, and here we, we are, have a lot of convergence in, in what we think the problem is. Um, the, the central problem that we are aiming to address through our work is that access to early childhood development and education in emergencies is not guaranteed, as we have heard from Lucy. And what is our goal? Ultimately, we want to guarantee access to early childhood development and education in emergencies to every child that needs it. So that really sort of sets the framework for our analysis and our work. So then, um, you know, among, of course, the many and complex causes of what this problem is, our work, and this is based on a critical analysis of the literature and the evidence, aims to address three main root causes of this problem. Again, the challenge of early childhood development and education in emergencies that we deem critical. And I'm gonna just summarize them quickly here. One, again, we heard from Lucy, there is a lack of prioritization of early childhood across institutional and government mandates and agendas. We know that. And this underprioritization is actually enhanced or more pronounced in emergency contexts. A second root cause we, we believe is that there is a lack of characterization and understanding of what those experiences are that allow for the scale up and sustainability of accessible ECDEIE, right? So that is a second sort of this, this, this issue uh, around evidence, which spaces like today we think are really important to kind of overcome some of, in particular, that barrier of, of, of understanding and sharing knowledge. And thirdly, we argue that there is a disarticulated, if you will, strategy for global advocacy for ECDEIE, right? And we think our hypothesis is that this presents a challenge to the sector as a whole, both globally as well as within countries. So in essence, what our work aims to do is to provide evidence to formulate strategic initiatives that address these root causes to drive us closer to our ultimate goal, right? So that's, again, the framework that we're applying here. So. Um, we are, um, let me see here, yeah, see. So, so how are we generating this evidence? We're doing this through four main methods. Uh, one, we are combining con uh, country case studies, in particular four of them in emergency settings or humanitarian crisis. Two, we have conducted a global stock taking survey where we pulled 118 international actors from multiple sectors. Thirdly, we conducted a scoping review of the grade literature that included a systematic content analysis of 218 documents and a forthcoming uh, academic review of the literature, right? So the purpose for today's discussion in particular is to present to you um, a triangulation of some of the findings that link data from one of the country case study from Colombia, our stock taking survey and the grade literature review. So that's what, what we're aiming to do. So what have we found? So thus far, again, looking at sort of those three sort of universes of data, if you will, our analysis points to six areas that as a field we believe warrant very careful attention, which are listed here. I'm gonna name them broadly. They include community and family participation, evidence brokering, workforce development and support, donor and finance engagement, and two interrelated, interrelated components, which include um, harmonization of humanitarian and national systems, humanitarian relief, I should say, and national systems for ECD policy development, and multi-sectorality, right, in the context of, of, of multiple uh, humanitarian emergencies. So today we're going to focus on our findings in these last two um, aspects that really fall under, we would say, the broader um, umbrella of, of coordination. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So Lucero will now share with you an illustrative example of the implementation of one strategy uh, that was implemented in Colombia, partially as a result of the work that we have been conducted with our partners there. So she will do this while also reflecting uh, on how the evidence that we are generating through this process actually can drive or can contribute to action, okay? So that is really the focus for today's, for the rest of the discussion that Lucero is going to guide us through. So over to you, Lucero. Thank you, Angie. Um, so before I dive deeper into the implications of our study, I want to mention that we chose Colombia due to its geopolitical characteristics and the convergence of factors such as migration, the co a protracted conflict, and the enactment of ECD policy, policy and framework, sorry. And I also want to mention that as a result of the research we conducted, we were able to publish this paper that you're seeing on your screen. And this paper was published in the New Directions for Child and Adolescent Development Journal. And here, what we do is explore the attributes and describe the attributes of early childhood education in emergencies in the country. And this paper is key for what I'm going to explain later. 
So for our research, basically what we did is we applied an analytical framework that combines domains from ECD policy and the humanitarian response cycle. And our results basically led us to findings across four main domains, which are the ones that you're seeing here, policy frameworks and system preparedness, strategic planning, data management and coordination, programmatic approaches and implementation, and resource mobilization and financing. And for today's discussion, I will focus on a few strategies that were implemented after our study was conducted that are related um, and try to strengthen coordination. Next. So in our study, um, so basically the analysis that we led about early childhood education and emergencies in Colombia showed us a few things. So the first one is that there's a very active education cluster in the country that works with international coordination mechanisms, specifically in terms of early childhood. What we learned is that the cluster is focused on ensuring the provision of uh, preschool services to, to children and that um, they are focusing also on ensuring feeding programs. And this is a joint effort between the Ministry of Education and the clusters organization. But um, despite this, what we also learned is that the humanitarian response needs to, needs to be strengthened uh, based on the comprehensive approach and nature of the ECD policy national and um, ECD policy and national law in Colombia which is zero to forever and to this end the intersectoral nature of the law would require that early childhood education and emergencies in the country is considered across the cluster system landscape next so basically what's the usability and the practical implications of our findings so as we continue exploring the system uh, we have understand that our findings contributed to the prioritization of early childhood education in emergencies in the country, and more concretely to establishment of an early childhood subgroup that um, lies within the education in emergencies cluster. And this uh, newly created group is very important because it has uh, included early childhood education and early childhood education in emergencies, in particular in programmatic efforts. More specifically, what we have learned is that this subgroup has been successful in adding uh, specific indicators and strategic objectives related to ECD in the programmatic efforts. For example, uh, they were able to include uh, a strategic objective that is to track the number of refugees and migrants that are enrolled in formal institutions and in informal program um, and activities, well, informal education programs and activities, which is very important. And when we reflect on um, when we reflect on which are the factors that led to this actionable knowledge and impact of our research, we have identified two main factors. The first one being that uh, we believe that designing and implementing the research across sectors is a key vehicle for action. In our case, we established a partnership between uh, academia and UNICEF, and this was very successful. And the other factor that we identified is that uh, research can serve as an advocacy tool by itself. Uh, in our case, for example, we conducted interviews with um, high level decision makers and with frontline implementing agencies and conducting these interviews and asking wide questions about education and emergencies in the country. Um, we saw, we, we closely saw how this became an advocacy tool. So this is very important. Also, we want to acknowledge that in tandem to our study, there were other factors that contributed to the establishment of an ECD subgroup. And the first, the first thing that we have to mention is that um, um, there, the Sesame Workshops was leading a, a research called Solid Basis and the evidence they provided and are the evidence that we were able to provide uh, were key. And this combined with the political will and a particular moment um, of interest for ECD was key and was a great lever for this area. Um, then, okay, so, so far this illustrative example of how research evidence uh, contributed to Colombia's early childhood education in emergencies has taught us many things. Here we want to highlight three main elements that constitute a risk, an opportunity, and a lesson for the sector. For the sector sorry. So in terms of the risk, even though we know that having an early childhood subgroup is key, um, we also know that this might come with the risk of um, duplicating efforts and basically how to address this the the strategy strategy to address this is to um, set strategic objectives and main goals 
from the early onset and to actively recruit all the organizations, stakeholders, and experts on early childhood and the, those organizations that are interested in the building capacity in favor of ECD to coordinate actions and to make sure that everyone is aligned. All, we also identified that, um, of course, having this early childhood subgroup is a great opportunity to put early childhood uh, at the same level of other educational levels that have, have historically received more attention. And finally, one of the main takeaways of our study is that the humanitarian response needs to take a life cycle approach in which an individual's needs are met holistically and namely nutrition, education, and health are all considered and addressed. And with this, I'm going to pass it over to Angie who's going to um, finish our presentation. Thank you, Lucero. So yes, so in closing, we have shared with you um, what we believe is a practical implication of research um, and an action framework that aims to drive, as we said in the beginning, to drive access to early childhood development and education in emergencies forward. Um, the implementation of strategic alternatives like the one that Lucero has shared with you, such as specifically the formulation of an ECD subgroup within the cluster system in Colombia needs to be evaluated over time, right? So this is really, as I was saying in the beginning, an iterative process, along of course with other strategies that are happening concomitantly to be able to determine the progress ultimately towards achieving the ultimate goal, which is guaranteed early childhood development and education to all children who are up against the challenge of a humanitarian crisis. So we welcome um, you know, continued support, a continued follow-up uh, to understand then kind of what are the continued lessons um, for the field from uh, kind of outcomes like the ones that, that Lucero has shared with us today. So that is our la last slide and I will pass it on to um, Bonita for the next speakers. A quick screenshot of our amazing partners and collaborators to whom we owe um, all of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica and Lucero. Um, thank you for this great presentation and sharing with us you know, lessons from Colombia. I think for all of us that work in the field at multiple levels, it's really important to continue thinking about the role of research and how it influences what we do in the field. How does it inform policy and action? How does it influence the implementation of programs in the field, as well as drive the course of action across the multiple levels? So we'll continue to learn from Colombia. I'm sure there are also other places and other countries from all the work that you have done that we could learn from. And we would like to thank you so much for, for the presentation. For our colleagues, we'll have questions at the end, please keep them coming through the through the, the chat and Lucero and Angelica will be able to respond to some of the specific ones. And for um, the last session that we will have this evening, um, I would like to introduce Mesa. And as I introduce her, I would like us to continue thinking about these children who are growing up in crisis and the need for stability in their lives, the need for caregivers and the, and, and the role the caregivers, whether they're teachers or parents or other individuals, resources within their own, uh, with, within that environment um, and what they can do and support these children. So we'll be exploring those ways, but most importantly for us going into this session is, is to continue thinking about whether they have the tools, they have the skills that are needed to continue providing support for, for these children. So to support us learn and explore those, you know, what is out there and what can be done, I would like to welcome Mesa Delbot, uh, who has been working very closely with their world, a global children's charity on refugee education for many, many years. And their world has commissioned Mesa to produce research and action plans to support better access and quality, especially in the Middle East, Europe, as well as globally. She's deeply committed to supporting the most vulnerable children in the world through the work that she does, through her expertise in education, how the specific work that she's been working on over the years and the research as well as technology. She's a special advisor to the, on the SDGs to SCU and the MIT and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute. She was the co-founding CEO of the Abdallah al Gurea Foundation for Education and the Queen Rania Foundation. She has as well served as the head of education, the education unit at the Global Affairs Canada. 
Mesa serves on multiple boards, both philanthropic and advisory boards. And I want to call out specifically the Global Business Coalition for Education and the Editech Hub. She is a co-founder of the podcast, The Impact Room. Um, please join me in welcoming Mesa. Over to you, Mesa. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you to my co-presenters. Uh, I was um, delighted to uh, hear that your research very much aligns with the research findings that I'm going to present today. Uh, I think the more of us that are working in this space and spotlighting the important uh, role that early childhood education plays in refugee settings, and in particular, the support that uh, teachers need in refugee settings, uh, the better. Uh, and thank you to um, the INEE ECD Task Force and MMA for organizing this uh, session. Um, I also want to give a, a quick shout out to my uh, co-author, Katie Bullard, who is here and will be available to also answer questions. Um, let's dive right in. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of skim through a lot of uh, details because you've already heard from my colleagues and because there's a lot of um, uh, commonality in, in our findings. Um, we all know that conflict and displacement can have a severe impact on children's development and well being. Fortunately, we also know that sustained nurturing relationships with adults can help mitigate and protect against these effects. And early childhood education educators can play a very important role in this process. However, despite the crucial role of early childhood education in supporting young refugee children, uh, ECE remains severely underfunded and undersupported in conflict affected con contexts. In fact, only 1% of development aid going to ECD in crisis affected countries um, goes to pre primary education. Uh, within this and from prior work uh, research that we have done uh, at Their World, we saw that there were huge expectations and hopes placed on uh, early childhood educators, but these teachers were often uh, not centered into the design or in the planning uh, and certainly not uh, always in the implementation of refugee education programs. So our research confirmed this and gave us insights into how we can better support teachers and professionals in, in this space. One important note for this presentation is that when uh, I say early childhood educators, I'm really referring to um, any adult who is supporting young children in center-based early childhood education programs. They may be formal teachers, facilitators, volunteers, or have uh, other informal titles. Uh, this research uh, was fully qualitative. It involved three components. First, a mapping of how early childhood education programs providers uh, provide professional development to their teachers. This included NGOs operating in a single context to large international organizations supporting programming in multiple con uh, contexts and countries. Second, it included a liter literature review on early childhood education and professional development in this context, and uh, a qualitative um, set of interviews with experts in, in, in this field. I will walk through some of our key findings, as well as some of the principles for future action that emerge from this work. Um, we, we've kind of slotted a, a little indicator on the side here um, to, to uh, um, you know, signify what, what we're emphasizing in each slide. An overarching finding from this research was that there is very little evidence related specifically to professional development for early childhood educators in refugee settings, both in terms of what is being done and what works to improve teacher practices, as well as raises student learning and support student and teacher well-being. Um, we therefore absolutely um, uh, you know, align with, with our colleagues here that we need more rigorous research, both at practices as well as more uh, program monitoring and evaluation. Along similar lines, there is limited guidance to early childhood education and especially 
uh, educators in refugee settings. We know that there is a growing body of uh, guidance on certain other aspects of early childhood development in humanitarian response and uh, ECE guidance in low, low resource settings, but very little is happening in refugee settings um, and in support of professional development of those who are working on the front lines. That said, there, is, there are many providers who are doing excellent work, innovative work, many of them working towards similar goals or similar principles. This means that you know, there are existing resources and efforts that future work uh, for supporting uh, ECE teachers can and should build on. Our research highlighted strong tensions between the global and the local. There was almost near universal agreement that early childhood development programming, including professional development, needs to be developed and refined in context. As part of this, there was resistance to the idea of a global standards or global accreditation system for professional development for early childhood uh, educators, which there, which was uh, seen as not necessarily useful or could be potentially counterproductive, but there was definitely a strong appetite for more resources and guided uh, and guidance grounded in refugee and crisis contexts uh, around the world. There was also agreement that any future action should elevate the existing work happening locally. This was a huge emphasis. Yeah, in, in the work that we reviewed and in the interviews that we conducted. Uh, our research also found that the question of how to balance theory and practice in teacher prof professional development remains a challenge uh, at this particular level. Interestingly though, while in other levels of education and in other contexts, professional development is often too theoretical, our research found that while uh, early childhood educator providers in refugee settings aim to balance theory with practice, when, re when resources are limited, though, they uh, often opt to just prepare teachers with strategies or activities uh, for the classroom without necessarily giving teachers the context to understand why these strategies are important or useful. Um, not surprisingly, and echoing findings from all contexts and all levels of education, there was also consensus that any new efforts should include consistent professional development opportunities, uh, as opposed to the uh, you know, ad hoc uh, or one-time type of training that often happens. And that ideally it would also be supported by coaching, mentoring, uh, and teacher communities of practice. For many early childhood providers, though, limited resources mean that professional development is often limited to training before service or very infrequently in service uh, trainings. And this was seen as a weakness in the uh, sector as a whole. In line with evidence from also uh, you know, level, other levels of education, prof uh, professional development tailored uh, must be tailored to teachers' needs and experiences and skills. This was seen as key and especially important for early childhood educators working in refugee settings because this workforce is so diverse, um, ranging from host country nationals to refugees, trained teachers to facilitators with little or formal education, some who speak their students' language and some who do not, some who are familiar with the student's home or the host country context and some who are not. With this type of diversity uh, and in some cases very low teacher capacity, it is particularly important that programs tailor their professional development to teachers' needs. Finally, many systems lack resources to serve all young children or even all host community children and refugee participation in formal education system is severely constrained by national policy in some settings. As with refugee education more generally, our research found that providers often aspire to integrate um, with national systems, but must plan for and respond to the current policy context while trying to work towards longer term integration. 
Before I jump into our recommendations briefly, I'd like to give an example of how one organization works to provide high quality professional development to its early childhood educators. We have a short video by uh, Ramir Hayem, who is a program manager at the Lebanese NGO Ana Akra, uh, to hear how uh, this organization supports teachers and responds to their needs. Teachers are also supported with in-classroom uh, coaching to improve their planning, uh, classroom management, instructional and professional skills. The coaches are equipped with a validated classroom observation tool and their coaching is based on reflective practice where thinking aloud about what to teach, uh, why to teach and how to teach make uh, teaching and learning more meaningful. And Akra also ensures that a teacher's well-being is accounted for. Uh, this is why An Akra provides PSS support services for teachers throughout the implementation. We believe that investment in teacher well-being uh, contributes to improved health and well-being for teachers and learners as well, and enable a stimulating learning environment that eventually lead to positive learning outcomes. Teachers are recognized uh, and appreciated for all their effort uh, during uh, a yearly teacher workshop. During this workshop, teachers uh, from different regions uh, in Lebanon come together to reflect on their uh, experience, to share lessons and discuss challenges that they can attempt to solve together. In conclusion, Ana Akra believes that the collaboration between the teachers, the learners, the trainers, the coaches, uh, and the caregivers not only improve uh, the learning environment, but it signals the importance of maximizing opportunities and engaging responsibility bearers to keep learning and progressing uh, continuously. Supporting teachers and caregivers and recognizing their work are core key elements to fulfill our vision and make learning accessible to all children. Misa, if you can quickly sub, you know, summarize, we are running out of time, so thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Remy. And if anyone uh, would like to find out more information, uh, they are featured in the, in the mapping work uh, in, in the report. So I'll just, summarize quickly some of the avenues for a future action that we recommended in the paper based on our research we proposed four avenues um, we have particularly been focusing on the first proposal which is to make basic information on the science of early childhood development more accessible to teachers uh, in in low-tech modalities and I can speak to that more in the question period. We've also proposed to support and incentivize local technical vocational institutions, providers to help train early childhood educators um, uh, and I'd love to delve into that a bit more and then to create peer learning communities to foster ongoing teacher learning and support and of course to translate uh, learning from local communities into broader evidence and resources through a learning hub system. Um, we're, we're creating a coalition of organizations, of, of partners uh, around this work, and we'd love to hear from anyone here uh, who may be interested uh, in joining uh, with us. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Mesa. I, I'm not sure where the time you know, flew to, but we are here, we have a couple of minutes remaining and would like to dive right in um, into the questions that you have. So we'll start with the first question that came from Suzanne Zudema and it goes to Lucy. Um, the question is what kind of practical suggestions, uh, you know, it, what kind of practice of practical suggestions um, practitioners in crisis crisis context are looking for. And she gives examples of, you know, are they looking for setup of an ECD space? What kind of activities do they do, et cetera? So over to you, Lucy. Oh, hi. Um, sure, so I, I was starting to respond to some of these uh, in writing. Um, for this one, um, so the study that I, the review that I presented on um, did not involve talking to practitioners, but in some other related work, I did 
do some consultation with practitioners. So I um, heard from some of the standards holders on what they have heard that people are looking for. Um, and then I heard separately from what practitioners directly are looking for. And some of those things were um, practical examples, um, program specific guidance, um, what to do at different ages for kids, um, different curricula to use, uh, consider uh, a lot of interest in how to adapt. So these, these standards are broad and global, right? And I think some of the other presenters have, have spoken to this tension of having, you know, you were, rec you were saying, um, Mesa, that uh, for professional development, we shouldn't just use these global, global guidance, but, um, but contextualize it. And so there is an interest in how to adapt. So how do you translate the sort of the standards um, and apply them in your particular case um, while and not watering it down. And, and you know, you still want those standards to ensure quality and to ensure, ensure consistency and um, benchmark. Um, but then we know that they're different realities. Um, and so I think that was really like, that's what practitioners are grappling with. They're like, I know that I'm supposed to do this best practice, but how do I do it in this case or with these constraints? Um, and so I think that's also why there is a desire for examples and case studies. And I, I like that you, you know, brought in um, that video because that gives you a sense. I think there's also a desire for show me that this can be done and show me where this has be done has been done and then I can feel empowered to do it myself and adapt and sort of make some adjustments. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, Lucy. And as, as we have you very quickly, Ben is asking, is there a role of the affected communities in developing these standards and contributing to you know, the standards that, for example, you are referring to? So he says, you know, something that JSI and others continue to find a challenge. The report highlights the need for additional consultations, including- Yeah, so- yeah. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting yeah. to hear from Kate about how INEE is thinking of involving different stakeholders in the review or, or you know, how standards are developed in the first place and whose voices are involved. Um, I think that, I mean, many people probably know much better than I the best ways to do this, but I do think, um, you know, many of us are working from afar, from a place of comfort and ease and safety um, and doing our best to recommend good practices and benchmarks and standards based on evidence and science and ethics and whatnot. But I think um, hearing some, what are parents and caregivers struggling with? What can they what makes it hard to do responsive caregiving or, you know, and so, so that these recommendations can address those things. And, and I think elevating what is being done in difficult circumstances, like where parents and caregivers and communities are overcoming challenges and able to do things that um, are really challenging as, um, as examples of, of how these things can be done. I don't know if Thank Kate you. or anybody else wants to chime in on that. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we're at the top of the hour. I know that some people might have a hard stop at, you know, at this point, but I would like to really invite those who can spare another extra five minutes or so, so that we can quickly go over the questions and then Nadia can give us a, a quick summary and, and, and wrap up. So if you, if you have to leave, we, we acknowledge that. But if you can, please do stay on for an, an extra few minutes so we can go over this question. So Kate or anyone from the Secretariat, if you want to add anything, please go ahead and then we'll go to the next question. Hi, no, I think, I think um, the, sorry, it's Kate here from, from INEE. I think I'll leave it to the panelists now, but the, our minimum standards update is underway and there is a comprehensive methodology for 
consulting really widely across, you know, all a whole range of stakeholders. Um, and so we're really looking forward to the kind of input on um, ECD, but also bearing in mind the research that their world uh, that Maya just presented saying, you know, where did, how do these global standards work? And so I think we're always very much aware that uh, in terms of the IME minimum standards, that they're, they always need to be contextualized. So um, I'll leave it there, but pass over to the others and, and thanks for everybody for excellent presentations. Thank you, Kate. Anyone wants to respond or we, or you can respond as the other questions come up. Uh, the next question we have is from George and he's asking if any of the panelists can share any experience on what role the political leaders in what role the lead, political leaders have in promoting um, development of, of children in the countries, especially those that are experiencing conflict. So any member of the panelists can go. I think we can take that on. And Lucero here, you can also chime in, but um, you know, part of our argument, I would say, um, has been precisely that is, sort of our need to work together right, with national leaders at the both national, subnational, local level um, of host countries or countries that are undergoing an emergency together with the humanitarian sector, right? That is one of the, of the areas that we have seen um, are critical. In a country like Colombia that has been in a crisis for decades, um, you know, the normative ECD system becomes that emergency and humanitarian response itself. So in that regard, you know, working in parallel with government leaders is really a missed opportunity. So, you know, I will say that in, in the context of Colombia, the role of the government is central. Um, there's several questions in the chat that I have answered to um, in writing that precisely highlight this, this compatibility, right, between the mission of the government and the missions of the humanitarian uh, sector and how they need to come together in issues around and ensuring inclusion in, in, in processes around indicators and long-term follow-up of children, again, who are in more quote-unquote normative settings as well as in crisis. So I would say that it's, it's, it's of course multifactorial, but absolutely central, I think, to the next generation of humanitarian response. Great, thank you, Angelica. Um, anyone else on the panel would like to add anything? Please feel free panelists as well to, to type out your responses as well. And the next question is from Suzanne, and it's a very interesting one as well. And, and Suzanne says, as a disabilities inclusive ECD specialist, I am particularly concerned that children with disabilities are often excluded from services in crisis and other fragile contexts. What can we do at the very earliest planning stages to promote inclusion for these children so that they can participate in early childhood programs with their peers from the start? Um, any panelists can go um, and respond to this. Angelica, Lucy. Well, I don't, I don't mean to take over, I'll be very brief. I did type up a quick thought on this and it, it links to this issue of um, the national sort of, you know, policy landscape and the opportunity that it offers precisely to do that. So. In Colombia in particular, the national law that Lucero mentioned is anchored in principles of what they call differential attention or differential services. And that sort of structurally invites or triggers programming that is inclusive. And this is the kind of policy characteristics that the humanitarian sector can kind of latch onto, if you will, uh, would hopefully also, again, trigger our humanitarian response that considers inclusion from the outset. So that is sort of the thought that I was sharing with Suzanne via chat. Great, thank you. Um, Mesa, there's someone asking if you can share the research findings, particularly the mapping of ECE projects in refugee yes, settings. Sir. So I'm sure that will be shared on the, um, on the, on the INEE uh, website based on, on the presentation. And one last question before I hand over to Neda is from George. And he says, in most cases, issues of children sit in different sectors, health, education, protection, nutrition, and so on. How can we develop indicators that capture to a large extent all these aspects? Again, you know, 
hey, you know, Lucy or Katie or anyone, please feel free to jump in. Maybe uh, Bonita, while my colleagues are thinking about that, can I answer a question from Nicola about whether teachers uh, in uh, early childhood educators in refugee settings are receive less priority than their colleagues at a higher level of education? Uh, the answer is pretty straightforward, and our research was um, clear on that. I mean, since early childhood education in refugee settings is uh, less funded than other levels of education, uh, naturally also teachers um, in the space in early, in early childhood education also receive less professional uh, development. And we found also that professional development is not central to the planning of early childhood education programming uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in most cases. Um, and typically because it is also less formal, um, it's not often integrated in the refugee education response or even part of the national education agenda, there is even less government support or, or guidance that um, is provided uh, to, to teachers. So I hope that answers that question. Great. Um, I know that people have lots of questions and I know we have run out of time. I would like to direct you to the, you know, to the INEE uh, website and continue to send those questions there. These presentations will be, um, you know, will be placed there for you to follow up. And at this stage, I would like to hand over to Nada. Thank you so much for your patience and for giving us extra time for us to go over some of these questions. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonita. And um, in just in the interest of time, because we are a bit over time, I just want to thank uh, Lucy for that great overview of the review of humanitarian standards. As she mentioned, we're putting, taking those recommendations into action and we'll be working with a large collaboration of organizations to, uh, you know, review and modify uh, those further, of course, uh, first and foremost with the INEE Secretariat. Um, I also wanted to thank Angelica and Lucero for a great, um, presentation of the scoping and review that they have done, and especially on the, the deep dive in Colombia, I think it was very interesting to hear very specific examples um, that I think can be, that are very relevant and translatable to a lot of other countries, especially the points around intersectorality and the need for um, strengthening coordination. I think that's something that we're seeing a great need for, um, you know, not only in the East Africa region, but in other, in other regions and countries as well. So thank you so much for that overview. Um, and lastly, to Maisa and uh, Remy, I think the focus on refugee settings um, and the professional development uh, point is, uh, points are very important. Um, and I think overall, it would be great to see how these three presentations and the work that we're all doing to follow up can potentially continue to coordinate. Um, if we can potentially continue to coordinate across organizations, that would be great. Um, Bonita, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to facilitate this um, on behalf of Katie and myself and the INEE ECD task team. And also want to thank um, Kate Moriarty, uh, Katie Bullard, Anna, uh, Eamon, who all of whom were a part of the planning or in the background kind of helping facilitate. Thank you all so much. Um, I think Bonita, we will end it and all facilitators and presenters, we will end there. Um, I think participants uh, are free to, to sign off. I would like to ask if we can just keep uh, the line open so that our panelists can continue to answer the Q&A uh, in the chat before we officially end the meeting. But thank, thank you all so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be, um, to be part of this, this group and we look forward to more webinars to come. Thank you all so much.